So welcome and thanks for having me here this Tuesday morning. So summer and rain outside. So it's typically as we have it in Sweden at least. Uh, so this is a session I did for a system center user group a while back, which is about managing browsers in Windows 10, or actually maybe it could be called managing Chrome instead, because that's what I ended up doing when I uh, researched all the different browsers we have out there, basically. Uh, so that's what we're going to focus on now. Uh, what's why the browser is a challenge to manage and how we manage it. Um, and my name is Jorgen Nilsson, of course. I, work, I live in Malmo in Sweden, really close to Copenhagen, really, really close. I can see the bridge from my bedroom window, basically. Um, <clears throat> and if you have any questions afterwards, just feel free to contact me. Um, so what's the challenges with browsers then? Well, the challenge is that security wants, wants one thing and uh, our end users want something else. Uh, and in the end, everyone wants happy end users, right? Especially when we move to the modern, modern part of the world where we are managed in a modern way. Uh, so that's basically our biggest challenge. Security wants to lock down everything and wants, in many cases, have everything that is always been. You're behind our firewalls. This is our security and we manage Internet Explorer because we know how that works. Uh, well, basically that will have to change right this is the latest statistics i could find which goes a year back and um, if we're going to focus on one browser to manage um, i think it should be the one that actually is used by about mm, i think it's i think the last one here is like 69.09 percent uh, of all browsers worldwide and i filtered out all the uh, mobile devices. So this is only Mac OS and Windows basically worldwide from, uh, yeah, you have the link down there if you want to play around with statistics. There's a lot of statistics on which the most popular browser is and for different devices and different regions and different worlds. It's actually quite cool. Um, so, um, so we have the Google Chrome browser and second is Firefox, but it's still only like 10, 11 percent. Um, and then we have the other one. So if we should focus on giving our end users what they want, they most likely want Chrome, right? Um, and what about Internet Explorer? Well, yeah, this is this is the best thing I can say about the Internet Explorer. Uh, it should have been buried already. Uh, we have some legacy out there, but nobody really wants to kill off the legacy because nobody knows what's happening. So the so Internet Explorer is still around, right? And Internet Explorer is also used by a lot of built-in stuff in Windows. Internet Explorer is a Windows 10 component, so it's supported with the operating system and stuff like uh, the Configuration Manager client, where you can in Software Center include a web page, a web link that uses the Internet Explorer in the background to render it. So removing Internet Explorer could cause some interesting results. Uh, but still, we need to, to take care of Internet Explorer. So how does it look then? What's the challenges? Well, the challenges we have is that we most likely want one browser. If we have Citrix, we have Terminal Server, we want one browser to support and give our end users. And, and that should never, ever, ever be Internet Explorer in 2019 because it's the most unsafe browser there is. Um, and it's way too complex to manage. And just look at it. I mean, uh, I work in a project where we develop a web portal for managing Windows clients. And uh, we use Internet Explorer because in Internet Explorer, we can launch executables from a web page. No other browser allows that. You can't even configure it so badly so you can't do that. It's actually blocked in many, many ways because it's extremely unsecure. Uh, so Internet Explorer should really, really go away. Uh, and if we look at the other ones, the challenges I see, which many customers have, is that we want we want one browser. And as soon as we go to Citrix or Terminal Server or something, we don't have Edge there. Otherwise, Edge is a very, very good, um, of course, a very good browser in from a management perspective and a security perspective. Does the end user like it? Well. Um, apparently not. 
Uh, I'm not saying this is not my personal <clears throat> uh, thoughts. This is actually statistics, right? So that's the problem. We want to give the users what they want, and the users want Chrome in most cases. Uh, so this is a challenge as well for us. Keeping them up to date, that's also a different topic as well, right? Because if we do the modern management stuff, everything should be evergreen and automatic. Just let them up, let Chrome and Firefox update automatically if you choose Chrome, Firefox or Chrome. Uh, but if you want more control and have a release control and have um, some regulations that you need to know exactly which version is installed on the machine and so on and so on, we can do that as well. Uh, so that's up to you as well on how you design your platform. And this, of course, will be a game changer when the new Microsoft Edge Chromium browser will show up because that will solve this problem that we can have it on server os and windows os the mac os we can have it on all the different um different uh or server os or os we like right so we can have the same end user experience the same configuration the same testing the same everything uh, so that will be a game changer and that's why it's so it's such a great great initiative from Microsoft to actually rebuild Edge with the things that we actually want Edge to be. Um, but right now we can't manage this. There are still some challenging challenges in there. Actually, the first dev channel I installed worked better than this one I have now. So uh, it's not ready yet. It, when it will be ready, it will change uh, the browser market, I think, once again. But I'm. it will to keep uh, to take back the part they lost to Chrome will be hard though. Um, so what if we do a short on Edge? What's good with Edge? Of course, it's built in, right? It's a modern app. It's way more secure than everything else. We have extension support. And I will talk about extensions in a separate topic later, because extensions is the most evil thing we have out there right now uh, in the world of browsers. Um, there are some different initiatives going on, but that's the biggest issue we have right now. Uh, you can do there's there's we can talk about that for an hour, but we shouldn't. Uh, it's Edge is of course secure. It's a modern app. That's great. It integrates with Application Guard, which actually can make your browser experience the most secure there is, because you can start a Microsoft Edge um, session in a different, totally virtualized environment. So we actually have it definitely cut off from everything else that's critical on your machine. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not seeing a very great pickup of Windows Defender Application Guard, uh, but I hope there really is, uh, and there will be soon. Um, Firefox then. Well, Firefox is really late to the party. That's the only thing I can say. Uh, it doesn't have an MSI installer. It's a seven zip repackage guide for the enterprise. Uh, it added group policy support maybe a year ago, and that's recently in this world, I would say. Still a great browser for home and personal use, but I wouldn't use it in a corporate because I can't manage it. Uh, in a good way, at least. So let's see what we can do with Chrome, which our end users use and want to use them. Uh, well. Chrome has actually announced a couple of years ago that they actually realized that the enterprise market is really important. So we will focus on the enterprise and market as well. Uh, and Microsoft has realized again that they have like almost 70% of the market. So Microsoft have released extensions for Windows 10 accounts, Windows Defender browser protection, application guard, there's legacy support. So if you have a XML file with uh, all your um, sites that should use Internet Explorer today, you can use Chrome policy to point to the same XML file and get Chrome to start Internet Explorer for you the same way that Edge does. So basically, we can have a great, great um, uh, experience. Uh, we manage it through group policy, and the group policies are actually quite extensive now. Uh, it's an MSI enterprise installer, and they thought about a lot of cool things, I think. Um, we can roam settings and bookmarks. Basically, I think we could easily say that it's enterprise ready. Um, so this is the um, plugin from uh, Microsoft for um, uh, phishing filter in 
Chrome. So they actually also realize that Chrome is one of the best, most used browsers, of course. So they do plugins as well. So we have the Windows Defender uh, browser protection. We have the Windows 10 user accounts. This is for my account. So basically, it supports Azure AD accounts. Uh, you can use uh, use it to get single sign-on for all the Microsoft services, and it also makes Chrome support conditional access. And that's also a big, big thing, right? So if I say that this web browser is only allowed, this web, this site should only be allowed to uh, be browsed by a machine that's compliant in Intune, we can use this plugin, and then the Internet Explorer, then uh, Chrome is uh, supported as well for conditional access. Uh, so that's actually great. So Microsoft is doing a great work as well, and that's about the adoption of Office 365, right? And conditional access. If you want that to be successful, you must support the biggest browser out there. Uh, so it's actually quite cool. Uh, so it actually gives us the things we need to use it as the enterprise option for us. Uh, there's also another um, plugin as well. We can see if we can show them in my instead. Um, we have the new one. So I can actually launch um, application guard if I like. So if I say new application guard window, it will fire up an edge session for me uh, that's protected by application guard. So again, if I, if I have my own list or how I might choose to manage it, I can point sites that are flagged as insecure or if we want them to be open in the application guard so they're protected uh, away from Chrome as well. And the end user can't do anything about that because we are in control. Uh, so it actually is, also gives us more tools in the toolbox to use it. right? And all these plugins can be forcefully installed and that's really cool as well. So what I can do is I can add the, the unique identifier for the plugin and the link to where it should be uh, installed from. Uh, so if we try to, I know you want to see everything instead, right? So if we look at the group policy, it looks like this, configuring installation uh, whitelist, and this is the forced installed apps. So basically I just add them in a line here, uh, one line for each browser, and then it uh, is forcefully installed. So when I start Chrome for the first time, it will check, okay, have I installed all the plugins I, ha I should have? No, and I will add them on as well. Uh, and if we force them to be in installed this way, the end user can't remove it either. So it's actually some sort of control as well for us. And if we want to do this in, in um, the modern world, we can do that as well. So if we look at the, our Chrome, my Chrome policy in uh, Intune, we can do the same thing. Basically, we can oh, load a bit. Uh, we can um, let's see if we have it here. Extension force list, uh, and then we can have have our own um, custom CSP that actually will do the same thing and forcefully install those two plugins for me as well: the Windows 10 accounts and the Windows Defend browser protection. And then, of course, when we do this, we do the ADMX ingestion first. So we take the whole Chrome ADMX file, include all the content in here, and just throw it on the machine as well, so we can actually manage it afterwards. Um, so it actually works extremely well. Um, and it takes, if you haven't done this before, trying to find um, um, the extension force list and the syntax for this, that, that takes a while the first time. Uh, but I have exported this policy and put it on my GitHub repository. I haven't published anywhere that I did it, but I will. Uh, so that will hopefully give you a quick start if you want to start using it. And I'm including roaming profile support in here as well and some other things that I will talk about. So I will, I will make sure that that's published somewhere if you like to try it out because it works really well. Um, the extensions in Chrome, that could also be a session for itself. Um, this is from April last year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the link is in here. Basically, there's a big problem. The problem is um, with extensions. The problem is this, basically. If we take, um, let's take my ad blocker. That's why I, think, why I installed it today. So if I go into my ad blocker, this is the basic uh, 
problem with all the extensions, right? So if I install an ad blocker, I actually give that ad blocker the permissions in Chrome to read and change all your data on websites you visit. I'm not sure how that is in line with GDPR and depending on which system you access, um, for example. Um, and that's the biggest problem we have. So what happened here is basically that you install an ad blocker, you give the ad blocker the permissions to read and change everything you browse to because nobody in the world could have some bad intent, right? And basically they ended up stealing uh, personal information from 20 million devices um, out there. Uh, and again, if we look at GDPR, that's probably some, uh, uh, that's a, probably a, a big breach in GDPR as well, depending on which information you had in there. So if you use Chrome and go to your local HR system, you will actually still send that information to the ad blocker. And I'm not saying that all ad blockers are evil. I'm saying that there are evil ones. If you look at the statistics, I think there are statistics from security companies saying that one out of 10 extensions in Chrome uh, are evil or are manipulated or are sold or whatever. There's a big, big thing about this. Um, of course, Google is listening. This article is a couple of weeks old. Um, they're finally making Google Chrome extensions more secure. They're forcing all their developers to uh, use uh, MFA on their developer accounts because that's a problem as well. If you develop a, an extension that's popular, people try to hack your developer account so they can ingest their own code in it and steal things from your users. Uh, and they're trying to change and diverse which permissions should be in there as well. Another thing that if we talk about end user experience, there's articles out there as well that made differences, made uh, comparisons with uh, how fast the browser experience is. And if you install an ad blocker, the funny thing is that then Chrome is actually really, really slow because the ad blocker itself takes up a lot of CPU and memory. Uh, so that's actually, I think there's lists. Um, if you think Chrome is slow, uh, this is the number one thing to do, get rid of the ad blockers because they're taking up too much uh, CPU and power these days. Uh, so extensions is a big discussion on ourselves. Uh, what we can do is we can do this. We can blacklist and whitelist extensions. So what I did in my example, we can take the modern one because it's more fun, right? So what I did here is basically I have, um, I have blacklisted um, everything. Uh, so everything is blacklisted. There's no value. The value in there is basically just a star. Um, so it blacklists everything. And then I whitelist the extensions that are allowed to be installed. So I have to whitelist my two extensions to be able to forcefully install them as well. So if I take that machine and try to install an extension, it will be blocked. Um, but I can, and then I can, if an end user wants an extension, we could make a conscious decision that this looks good and then we can whitelist it. Um, and this is this is about privacy, data security, everything. Uh, so I think this is an important thing to do. Absolutely. Um, many users won't like it though, but that's that's a change as well. And GDPR and every all the other data laws are pulling us that way anyway. So what if I want to take control of Chrome and I haven't done it today? Well, if you haven't done anything, all your users are using Chrome anyway, because it's installed. If you look at this little nice installer, they're very nice to our end users, because if we haven't done anything, it will actually see that, sorry, you're not an administrator. Do you want to install it anyway? And then we install it in the end user profile instead. So what they did is they actually, there's an enterprise MSI. That enterprise MSI installation will actually replace the shortcuts uh, on the end user desktops to the Google, to the Chrome. And it will actually, well, it's not, this is the problem with Chrome. It's not really consistent between versions. It should say, it should sh sh show the message to the end user saying that your Chrome is now being managed by your company. I've seen it and I have seen that it's not there. So, um, and it will actually remove it from the user profile. So we can control that it's the which version we like if we have compliance laws and rules 
hitting us. And otherwise we can let it uh, update itself and all that discussion. But we can take control of it and we can deploy it with our modern managed client or our own legacy client as well. What about settings then? I wrote a blog post on how we can use the profile uh, PB support in OneDrive. And the first comment I got on my blog, it's a very nice comment, is saying, why don't you use a Google account instead? Well, basically the whole idea of using uh, roaming setting is again, uh, where can I um, store my data? Where is, where, what's allowed in my company for data policy? Um, is it support? Is it allowed to save passwords in Chrome? If so, the all the passwords on my or is roam to the Google Cloud. Is that allowed? And that's basically up to every organization saying what they want to do. Um, but if we want to take control of it, there is now um, a settings in since Google Chrome 69, I think, which had some challenges to start with, but now it works great. Uh, basically, it's enabled through group policy or Intune, of course. Uh, it can change uh, the default location is this um, for the file, but basically it will save one file with all your bookmarks, passwords, uh, uh, shortcuts, uh, uh, everything, favorites, everything you like. Uh, the only thing it doesn't store is the extensions as they all have to be installed and the settings for extensions. That's not included in this. Uh, we can then put it on UEV or wherever we want or OneDrive for Business for that matters. Um, so it works really, really well. Um, it's um, basically we configure it. Uh, we can start here. Basically, we configure our little... Um, policy here saying that we want to move these so i set enable the creation of roaming profiles uh, uh, for google chrome profile data and then we set where we want it stored if we want in a custom location so in this this case i'm using one right for business and i'm using the known folder move and then i write uh, dollar and this this is this is the variable from Chrome that points to the my to my documents basically. So in my documents folder, I will get the documents Chrome settings uh, where I where uh, my profile PB file is. Uh, so then I can roam my settings with between machines, and it's it's extremely uh, nice end user experience, I think. So if we see if we look at this machine. I have my Chrome here, and if we look at my OneDrive in my documents, I have my Chrome settings, I have a default, and I have my profile PB. So that will actually roam everything and yeah, I do in Chrome to my other machines. Um, I actually cheated a bit because the demo gods wasn't with me this morning. Uh, so using that will be something like this. Uh, when I do it with uh, OneDrive for Business. So basically, I type a URL, I add it as a favorite to my uh, bar, so it ends up here, and then I, uh, then I can see that the file is updated if I like. Uh, and then I start my other machine, start Chrome on my other machine, and then it takes like only one second and the bookmark is there. Um, I try to get it to create a conflict, and yeah, you can do that. Uh, if you open Chrome on two machines at exactly the same time and you make it and change at exactly the same time, uh, there will be a conflict. But um, I haven't had that in practice or real life. Uh, I haven't seen that, only when I try to force it. Uh, and for you using UEV, we can do the same thing with UEV, right? But then I leave it in the default location, and then I use a UAV template instead. It will do the same thing for us um, again. And it will move passwords and everything. So it's if we allow password moving or saving, that's actually quite nice. Uh, so that will um, also uh, show up and move in this exactly the same way. Uh, so I think Chrome is, uh, is a really, really uh, fun thing to do, because not many companies 
they don't if we if they many customers I talk to say well if we ignore it exists we don't have to manage it but we have to because it's about security and data and everything so it's time to take control of these things um, we can also do this in Chrome uh, if you manage it through group policy you can always uh, write Chrome policy so Chrome has a lot of cool things in it uh, to help us do this as well. Uh, so we can write um, Chrome uh, uh, settings. You can have all the settings in there that you configure. We can write uh, policy. We can see all policies are being applied on this Chrome browser. And if we use the sync one, we can do like this. Then we can see exactly how the sync is working, if it's active, if it's disabled, how it syncs, how many bookmarks, preferences, passwords, uh, wallet, uh, metadata, exactly how typed URLs, everything that it roams as well. So we can actually see that on the clients if we need to troubleshoot as well. Um, so Chrome has a lot of cool built-in stuff for us as well, um, where we can use. Uh, we also have legacy browser support, as I said. It's a bit more than extension. It's actually a Windows installer plus extension. So we need to install an MSI and an extension. Then we get some new uh, policies as well, uh, how that should be. And then we can use this as well. Use Internet Explorer Enterprise Side Mode list policy and point to the same file and have that uh, work in basically the same way. So that's really a good way as well and intune i already showed you we the biggest challenge with intune is that some policies when you go down this road and start testing it out some policies both in the admx file and in the group policy management console you can see this uh, this policy is not available on windows instances that are not joined to the microsoft active directory domain so we can actually set the policy through um, um, in tune, you can see that the policy is applied, but it doesn't work. Nothing happens. Uh, so that's the that's a good tip I can give you as well. When you try to do this and you start using Intune to manage Chrome, have a look at that text because if that's there, I've I don't know how many hours I spent trying to think that it would work anyway, uh, but it doesn't. So don't um, don't waste your time trying to do it, but look at that before uh, you try to set it instead uh, because it's only valid for ADM joined machines then. And I already showed you that the interesting part is at the end if you try to find the syntax as you can see here, uh, we when we do the custom URIs, they have a you have the uh, URI here, which is the groom policy and every this is the easiest thing is to do the ADMX ingestion and then on a, on one of the machines, have a look in the registry on the policy manager, ADMX default uh, and the grid. And then you have the whole path there and just copy that because there are some different uh, characters like in this case. Uh, so it's easier to do this than trying to guess what, uh, how it will actually look in the registry and what syntax to use. Uh, so look at that register key and uh, copy that information back to your Yuma URI. That's how I start every time because it's a time saver. Um, and then if we want to really enforce this as well, uh, some customers, some some companies has a policy saying we only support this browser, use the other ones on your own risk. Some companies say this is our browser, you shouldn't use anything else. Uh, and then you can uh, block it and that's a good security thing as well block everything block applications from being installed and executed from your user profile uh, that's a good thing uh, from security perspective as well uh, but we can select to either block just a specific one or a whitelist or blacklist again uh, so that's up to you and it works just as well through modern management as it just through group policy uh, so that was high high speed through the presentation I have like 30 seconds left I think uh, so what I would recommend is develop and document the browser strategy uh, communicate it with your end users and the purpose of it if it's data integrity that you don't want them to use a Google Chrome account explain that and give them 
the same end user experience anyway um, and talk to the end users and again internet explorer should never be the default browser it should hopefully not be able to browse the internet at all anymore because it's really unsecure as always and chrome is in my book the most enterprise ready third party browser out there so that basically that's it for me uh, a lot of chrome uh, management things i will try to post the uh, github repository link as well um, but i hope you got some new ideas on what to do with chrome and secure your environment uh, and we have some q a in the end so i'm, I'm ready and psyched for that so take all your questions with you to the q a